Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Australian National Maritime Museum's live webinar of tonight's Ocean Talk, Cook, Man or Myth. My name is Bill Harris, and I'm the Project Director for Encounters 2020 program here at the museum. I'm your host for tonight. I'd like to start by acknowledging the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, the traditional custodians of the land and waters upon which the Maritime Museum is located. I'd also like to pay my respects to the Gadigal, their culture, elders past and present. I would also like to acknowledge all traditional custodians of the land and waters throughout Australia and pay my respects to them, their cultures and elders past and present. I warmly welcome you to our first, very first live Ocean Talk webinar. Ocean Talks are a monthly series of live talks featuring marine experts, academics, authors, filmmakers and adventurers to bring you their unique perspective and understanding on a range of maritime topics. We are thrilled to be able to convert tonight's Ocean Talk into a live webinar during this unprecedented time of COVID-19. Now a quick overview of tonight. Each of our panellists will share their insights before engaging in a conversation around our key topic. Following this, we'll have a short Q&A session and hopefully we'll get to as many of your questions as possible. Regarding questions, your questions, at the bottom of your screen, you'll see a Q&A icon. At any time during the talk, please click on the Q&A icon to submit your question. We have two very special guests with us tonight. Joining us remotely is Professor John Maynard, while here in the studio is Peter Fitzsimons. Our Ocean Talk tonight will discuss Captain James Cook, the man behind the myth. Was he a good bloke? Was he a violent aggressor? A villain? All of these things. What were his achievements? What is his impact and legacy on all Australians, but in particular for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people? For many people viewing and listening tonight, our first guest needs no introduction. Peter Fitzsimons is an Australian journalist, radio and television presenter and author. He's authored over 30 books, including his most recent book, James Cook, the story behind the man who mapped the world. Welcome, Peter, thank and you. thank you for being here this evening. Thank you. Peter, to get us started, I wonder if you could give us an insight as to mm. what brought you to write the book. What was the genesis of the idea? And in doing so, tell us a little bit about mm. Captain James Cook, the man, his personality, his, his traits. Well, I like the title, Man or Myth. <clears throat> and the beginning of the book was my wife. I must have been five or six years ago saying to me, you've got to do Cook. I said, why Cook? And she said, because this bloke hovers over Australian history, somewhere up there in the clouds. He's, he's always mentioned in dispatches. He's always referenced, he's pilloried, he's celebrated. But who was the man? And I thought, that's a very good point because he's the guy through all of history and his share price has risen <laughs> and fallen upon what the politics of the time. So around Federation, he was absolutely red hot. Right now, as we're going through, hopefully constitutional recognition, he's absolutely pilloried by a lot of people. And the idea of the book was to just try to cut three or four researchers loose, get every written document I could get my hands on to, to work out who he was, what he was about. And the answer to who he is, I must say, did not come easily. When I did my book on Ned Kelly, you only have to read the Geraldry letter and these massive Irish Australian hands leap from the page and grab you by the throat and pull you down into the words. And you're talking to Ned Kelly because it's that kind of thing. With Captain Cook, he does not leap from the page. He's not, and I put him in terms of people that I've written biographies of, a little bit like Douglas Mawson, just, just a, a, a very controlled man, not maybe fierce emotions inside, but they weren't written on his face. I love the line of Boswell, the great biographer of his age, who said that the quote was, a grave, steady man. And I think that's those, those three words sum him up. A grave, steady, maybe that's four words, three words. 
file forwards, <laughs> um, that, that sums him up of, of the sort of fellow he was. He came from very poor beginnings. Father, you know, his father was a day labourer, rose to the position of foreman, um, but he showed a great deal of ability in, in early sort of elementary school. He had patrons that pushed him along the way. He worked in, uh, in retail, in, in, a, in, in a store, and basically dreamt, the, the story is, dreamt, looked out the window and saw the, saw the boats and say, one day I'd like to, one of those. And he then goes to, he joins the Merchant Navy. He rises very quickly, basically on the colliers going up and down the coast of England and occasionally across to Europe. And he, he rises and rises. He meets a wonderful woman by the name of Elizabeth, uh, Elizabeth Batty, I think her name was. And anyway, they begin, they begin their marriage. He then, his ambition, and they, have, they end up having a total of six children. Mm. He then, he then joins the Royal Navy and prospers, and he discovers this new, new way of doing cartography, not just going, yeah, look, it looks, there looks to be a bit of a headland there, but taking it seriously, measuring angles and moving your distance and basically working from an isosceles triangle. If you know the distance mm. of your base and you can do your angles, you can work out exactly where that feature is and that feature is and draw it on the page. And on the basis of that, um, they, he then went over to Newfoundland um, during, the, 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 during the war, and it was basically because of his maps that England was able to prosper and, and win that war against the French for control of North America, certainly on the East Coast. Mm. And so and at one point, I think it was 1766, he did ast astronomical calculations for the eclipse of the sun while he was in Newfoundland. And this came before the Royal Society, the most influential body of, of scientists in England. Basically, who, who has done these calculations? This is extraordinary. A fellow by the name of James Cook. Mm. Did he go to Eton? Did he go to Oxford? Did he go to Cambridge? No. He basically started out learning it on the back of a shovel, a la Abraham Lincoln, more or less. We need to see him because another great story out of this was the previous century, late in the 17th, well, in the late in the 1600s, Edmund Halley of Halley's Comet fame, the great astronomer, basically before he died, it's like a like a like a potboiler novel, but leaves a note to say, by the way, there'll be the transit of Venus across the sun. I think it's every 243 years. Comes in twin pairs every eight years, but 243 years apart. You better get somebody in the Pacific in 1769 to work out if you could if you could calculate if you could chronicle. The, and do your calculations of the transit of Venus across the sun and work out the exact instant that it crosses and the exact instant it leaves, you can work out basically the key to the universe, the distance from the Earth to the sun, et cetera, et cetera. They call up James Cook. He's impressive. He, he comes back. He addresses the Royal Society. You're the guy. Here's 20 pounds. Fit yourself out. Get yourself some boots and some coat and, mm. and there's the endeavours waiting for you. And meantime, Joseph Banks, I wanted to call my book originally The Odd Couple, Joseph Banks and Cook, because <laughs> Banks is such an extraordinary figure. Banks doesn't get 20 pounds. Banks puts 10,000 pounds on the yeah. table and says, I'm coming too with my retinue of botanists. So they head off on the endeavour. And my my particular book, which is right there, I might as well give it a plug. Yes. I'm, not above, I'm not above that. There you go. There's the book done. Um, they get, they, they, he, he, I think 95 on the endeavour. And he had a great feel for the men, for the sailors. And he understood that scurvy was the scourge of the age. Um, he understood also that sauerkraut was the, the thing to make them survive. The men didn't want to eat sauerkraut. He said, no more sauerkraut. Sauerkraut's only for the officers. And he instructed all of his officers to, to eat the sauerkraut. After two weeks, the men said, we want sauerkraut too. All right, you can have sauerkraut. And he was not. So they get to Tahiti and Tahiti um, to to chronicle the transit of Venus across the sun and they build a fort and they establish basically an observatory and Tahiti is for the sailors from many, you know, from the slums of, slums of England, a, a, an Eden by the sea. And basically if you put out your hand, a mango or a mm. pineapple, or whatever would fall into your hand. There was fresh water and they had a very libertarian sexual culture and they partook the sailors partook very, very heavily, and by my account, by, by most most accounts, the one person that did not partake at all was Captain Cook. He was removed from all that, 
probably the one man on the ship that was remained faithful to his wife at home. They then, so they have, they, they are there, I think it was five, five months, they chronicle, I think it was the 5th of June, 1769, they chronicle the transit of Venus across the sun. They then go to New Zealand and, and they're looking for the Great South Land. They can't find the Great South Land. Cook doesn't think it exists. And New Zealand, I think it was in the first 48 hours, nine Maori were killed mm. and tragically and Cook tossed and turned in the night. And Cook was not a vicious shoot them all down. Yeah, that seems quite out of character. Yeah, well, but it was it was his men. There, there were bit, there were I think there was three separate incidents. Some of them drowned. One man shot uh, a sailor shot a man, and they were all tragic, unforgivable. But it was not Cook giving the orders shoot them down. And the part obviously that and then they circumnavigated New Zealand, um, the two islands, and Cook the map that Cook drew was still in use. It was so accurate. It was still in use in the late 1970s. It was, the, it was late 1970s before satellite technology enabled them to do a better map than the one drawn by Captain Cook. But obviously the, the, the thing that most fascinated me was the one of getting to Australia. Mm. So they, they leave New Zealand, they circumnavigate New Zealand, they do the map and they get to Australia and they get to the, the uh, southeastern tip and they come up the coast and it's around Borley Point that for the first time they they can see figures on the shore the natives the first nations people um and then they're looking for a, an inlet to come in and that's for me where the story is just extraordinary yeah perhaps tell us a little bit peter about you know cook's uh, encounters with first nations people of australia well the first thing that stunned me and i first read this 20 years ago in tim flannery's book and it was something that um, Tim Flannery did an anthology of Sydney and there was an account there. And I remember reading it thinking that is stunning. And then when I did this book, there it all was. But as 29th, 29th of April, 1770, they come through the heads of Botany Bay. And there are four indigenous fishermen in their small canoes with their spears, looking, looking, you know, about to spear some fish. The Endeavour sails by about 300 yards away perhaps a thousand times bigger than any man-made object they have ever seen. And they do the most stunning thing. They don't look up. Clearly a cultural quirk, but something that defies my understanding, but something perhaps not showing fear, perhaps thinking it was ghosts or the, the other story was that there they, they were possums scrambling because they saw the sailors with the long, pony, with the long ponytails mm. out the back and they thought they were huge possums, but they don't look up. The endeavour comes through and it then steers to the south of Botany Bay and, and drops anchor off the southern shore. And here is the part that when I, when I put it out, you know, I got, this was what got the biggest reaction. And it was the biggest reaction I got when my researchers pointed it out, that as they, the two boats come to the shore, okay, so we get, I think, 12 Marines in each and they're pulling towards the shore. And the way is blocked by two brave indigenous warriors and they're holding spears and they've got a shield and they say they shout at cook and his men warra 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 why and it basically translates to go away seriously go away we're not joking try us on go away leave us alone cook they 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 shout at them in english obviously no reaction They've got the Tahitian priest with them, the holy man that they'd brought with them from Tahiti and his language had worked in New Zealand. He shouts at them, no reaction. They throw various baubles, shiny things which had worked on the Pacific Islands. The First Nations, two warriors, no interest whatsoever. Cook then gets a musket, puts in birdshot, not lead balls, not to kill, mm. fires between the two warriors. They don't move. They still hold their ground. Cook then loads it up again, fires at there were an older man and a younger man, and fired at the man on the left. And not to kill, but to sting and make him move. And for me, when I first came across this, I go, you, what? This can't be true. This, this, how could it be? And I was speaking at ANU a year ago, April last year, and I said, I told him I was doing this book. And I said, you're all you know, serious academics, some of you historians. How many of you know that Cook actually shot the first two Indigenous men, warriors he ever saw? Not a hand went up. Mm. I didn't know that mm. and I couldn't believe it. And I was very careful in my footnotes to put 
the actual quotes. I mean, Cook says, and then I shot them, S-H-O-T-T. And it was stunning to me that such an extraordinary thing could have not be, I mean, for us, this is the most, in terms of the nation as it is now, this is an enormously, the iconic moment of the, of not because the Dutch had been all over it for 150 years mm. on the West Coast, but on the East Coast, and in terms of Australia then being settled by the British, this moment of a British foot about to be planted on Australian soil, the way is blocked, Cook grabs a musket and shoots the man on the left. Wow. Yeah. How did we not know that? And when I was going through all the books by other historians over the, over the last centuries, 250 years, the absolute standout is J.C. Beaglehole. So he's a New Zealand historian and the best in the business and thorough and went right into it. And I think he journeyed to England a dozen times and goes, gets to back to the original documents. These days, we can do it over the internet and you can mm. actually see, you know, Botany Bay starts out as Stingray Bay and you can see Cook's scrawl takes it out from Stingray Bay, Botany Bay. But when you read J.C. Beaglehole on that account, and he wrote it in uh, the biography, his biography was released in 1974. He gets through that part of it in half a sentence. And I think it was, and the Warriors didn't even, weren't, didn't even move despite despite the shot coming at them, but mm. didn't name Cook as the one that fired the shot. And what stuns me, I, can't, I mean, I, I suppose it's the, all of us writers over different centuries, different decades, you react to the, the mood of the time. So I suppose Beaglehole, writing that in the late 60s and 70s, white man lands on black shore, way is blocked by black men, fires gun at black men to make the move, maybe not such a big deal. In my time, in, in this time, I look at that and I'm stunned at my mm. own ignorance. I'm stunned that we all don't know about that. And yet, despite the fact that Cook was fired that shot, it was not, this was not a vicious man. This was yeah. not a man that was aimed to kill. And I got into a Twitter storm last night um, where I, I mentioned coming here and, you know, and people saying, what was the first one saying? You're, what? <laughs> I've been learning how to cough. Um, said, why are you doing this? You're a Republican. Why are you celebrating mm. Cook? And I said, for a start, I'm not celebrating. I'm trying to bring to life a life long gone by trawling through every document there is to make the man live and breathe, to work out who he is, what he did. And by and large, he was a fundamentally decent man. The answer came back, he was a rapist. Mm. No, no, he was not a rapist. He cut loose rapist. No, not in the f first voyage that I know about. It, certainly in Tahiti, it was all, there was no, mm. there was no force used that we know of. Um, but people wanted to demonise Cook to say he was a bad man. I think I'd be very interested in the professor's view, mm. Professor Maynard's view. But by my reckoning, coming at it from outside with no preconceived notions whatsoever, he was a fundamentally decent man. And I also put in my book that rather, and people say he was a coloniser. Well, no, actually, he wasn't a coloniser. He was an explorer. He was a navigator. What he fundamentally was, was a great maritime man. He was a great navigator. He was a great uh, cartographer, the best in the business as a cartographer, or maybe the second best in the business after William Bly. Yep. Oh, have I just about done? Okay. And so... That was Captain James Cook. So it was interesting, <laughs> but I'm interested in Professor Maynard's view. Yeah, thank you, Peter, for that fantastic uh, insight into Captain Cook. Um, and it's a great uh, opportunity for us now to introduce Professor John Maynard. Uh, John is a Professor for Indigenous Education and Research and leading historian at the University of Newcastle, New South Wales. He is credited with unearthing links between early African-American and Aboriginal politics. He is considered one of the world's most prolific and respected voices on Indigenous history, internationally regarded as an expert on issues ranging from military involvement to political activism and sport. Welcome, John, and thanks for being here this evening. Thanks very much, Bill. Pleased to be here. G'day, Pete. How are you going, mate? <laughs> before, um, before we look specifically at, at Cook, uh, I wonder, John, if you could outline briefly for our audience uh, what life was like for Aboriginal people in 1770? 
a virtual paradise of plenty, Bill. I mean, <laughs> that's the best way of looking at it. I mean, we need to step away from the idea that we were living in central Australia. And when you look at the east coast of Australia, the south coast, Sydney Harbour, Newcastle, um, Port Stephens, all the way up the north coast, you know, magnificent country, magnificent waterways, and as I said, a virtual paradise of plenty. There's a lot of accounts later after Cook. And I mean, you can go back, say, 40 years after Cook's arrival um, to get some accounts of of how rich Aboriginal lifestyle was. And um, again, looking back to the Newcastle region and area, one observer said, um, I've, the blacks are much taller than Europeans. I've seen them five foot eight, five foot nine, even six foot two. So Aboriginal people were magnificent specimens of health, if you like. There was another Lieutenant Coke, a British Marine based at um, the penal settlement in Newcastle again, it's over 40 years after Cook, but it gives us some idea again. And Coke was saying that he used to sit and watch Aboriginal women dive into what is now Newcastle Harbour and come back to the surface with lobsters in each hand three and four times the size of anything we've ever seen in, in Europe. So it was this, in, and wherever you go in those early accounts at these magnificent middens of um, shells yeah. that just line the coastlines and just show the you know, the abundance of uh, marine life that was available. And Peter's book and many others also accounted that, that Cook's observations of uh, an Aboriginal fire um, at Gamay or Botany Bay, and he came up, the Aboriginal people had disappeared, but uh, he came up and he said there were fresh um, mussels broiling upon the fire, and beside that were the largest oyster shells I've ever seen. So again, it comes back to this, rich lifestyle and the abundance of food. And uh, certainly the Endeavours crew were able to take that on board. Banks made in the canoes of the night time with their fires. So Aboriginal people still fishing at night, spearing, spearing fish at oh, the night time. So um, yeah, a very rich lifestyle. Mm. Thanks, John. And then just following up on from that, uh, yes, what would Aboriginal people have thought of Cook and the crew and the Endeavour as it as a voyage along the East Coast? Yeah, to be a bit like uh, H.G. Wells and, um, you know, the, the arrival of the Martians. I mean, that, uh, seeing a <laughs> ship the size of the Endeavour that Peter was just speaking about. I mean, although the Endeavour wasn't a big ship, I mean, it's not much bigger than a tennis court um, I mean, in reality, but certainly far bigger than any of the Aboriginal people have seen. And again, we have to go past, well, I mean, Cook for accounts, and it was... Um, Marut, who um, gave testimony to uh, a select committee, I think it was 1845 in Sydney, recounting um, Aboriginal people's observations when the first fleet arrived. And they said that they saw, you know, the, when they saw the people going up and down the masts, they thought of our possums. So these accounts say, so you're seeing something from another world. And I think um, books, again, like Peter's, are the observations of Aboriginal people just disappearing into the background when the cook and his crew came, a, came ashore, except for the two warriors, certainly you, in the first instance, uh, forboy, forbade them from getting ashore. Mm. So, yeah, it was, there was certainly some shock and, um, how can you say, um, you know, it was just a, a, a surreal experience, I guess, if you like, and, you know, you know um, something from another world. Mm. Quite, quite incredible to try to, to work through. Yeah, absolutely. And can I ask then, John, following up on from that, your sense of, of how Cook viewed the, the um, first Australians that he would have come across and encountered and, you know, how, I guess what uh, shaped that viewpoint from Cook's yeah, perspective? I, I, I think Peter's touched on that as well. I mean, I have to say that um, Cook was not your normal British naval officer of that time period. He wasn't well-to-do. He wasn't from the right side of the street. He wasn't privileged. His father was a poor farmer, a labourer, um, a labourer on a farm, not a farmer. He was a labourer on a farm. So um, he didn't come from the right background. What got him there was his skill, and certainly that's been touched on. I mean, um, and his observations of Aboriginal people come from that perspective. He has a different viewpoint of being able to, how can you say, take in the world around him from a from a different viewpoint. And I think one of the best quotes about Cook in, in regards to um, 
certainly Aboriginal people is that they, they appear far happier than, than us Europeans. Mm. They live in a tranquility undisturbed by the inequality of life. You know, they live in a, a warm and temperate climate. So they have a good air to breathe. I mean, what Cook was seeing was an egalitarian lifestyle and a way of life that certainly captured him. And you've got to remember, and as I said, Cook's able to observe that, that um, the inequality in England, and that at that time period, raw sewage used to flow through the streets of London. Disease mm. was rife. Opportunities for people to come up the ladder um, were extremely rare, extremely rare. And life was, um, as I said, in many instances short. And I mean, it's been touched on, Cook had six children. None of them lived to, or two lived to adulthood, but their mother, I mean, and she lived 50 years longer than Cook, outlived all of them. So life was short and precious mm. in that sort of lifestyle and that time period. So, yeah, I mean, um, Aboriginal lifestyle is certainly what Cook observed was something to envy. Yeah. Thanks so much, John, for that overview. The, um, tonight's topic is Cook, man or myth. Um, I'd be interested in, I guess, in your thoughts on the significance of Cook for Aboriginal people today, at, you know, 250 years later. Yeah, look, I mean, <laughs> he's, the, he's the quintessential bogeyman for Aboriginal Australia. If you want to have someone to blame for everything to come later, I mean, I guess Cook gets a Guernsey. I mean, because, um, I mean, and that's, I guess, in many respects, understandable. Um, what came after in 1788, I mean, um, Noel Butlin, the economic historian, um, in his book um, um, of the 1980s, Our Original Aggression, um, he gave an estimation of the Aboriginal population, which much, was much greater, and he estimated about a population of a million. Butlin also accounted that only four decades after the British got here, the Aboriginal population in Australia was decimated by somewhere between 60 to 90 per cent. Now, that was through violence but also most predominantly through disease. And certainly the smallpox epidemic of 1789 had catastrophic impact, certainly through the trade routes of Aboriginal Australia. So, you know, and the stories that go right across this country, it's amazing where, you know, whether you're in Arnhem Land or the Kimberley or in central Australia or on the north coast or even at Picton in western Sydney, there are Aboriginal stories talking about Cook, that Cook was there, Cook visited them and Cook was shooting people, Cook was raping women and Cook was taking them over the country. It's an Aboriginal way of understanding history and understanding what has come later. And that's a viewpoint of putting that into perspective and understanding that. And that's why these stories are so prevalent right across the country. And as I said, they've been recorded in Central Australia. I guess it was Captain Cook. He was out here shooting people. And as I said, uh, up in the Kimberley as well, these stories are so prevalent. Uh, whether he deserves that uh, mantle, I mean, well, <laughs> that's, that's open to con conjecture. I mean, I have to say myself, personally, I mean, I have to admire Cook. I mean, Peter's touched on that as well. For me, I mean, he was an incredible navigator, cartographer, leader of his crews. I mean, you can't take that away from this man. And as I said, I've been on the Endeavour replica and there's no way in the world I would have gone on that ship. No. Sailed around the bloody world. <laughs> <in other places. laughs> and uh, it was so small, you know, when you take into consideration and you had to bend down to, uh, to get along on those bottom decks and that sort of thing. So you give, you give um, credit in that regard. Um, to uh, his achievements, certainly, as a navigator and cartographer and, uh, and a leader, um, undoubtedly. Yeah, thanks, John. I certainly, um, as part of my work here at the Maritime Museum, having uh, travelled the country quite a bit, talking about Encounters 2020 program, that sense of Cook's connection to, um, you know, the, the, to invasion and to dispossession and to um, many things in terms of he is a myth mythological figure that represents uh, you know, the plight of, of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people now um, as distinct to the achievements of, of the individual and his great skill as a captain and a cartographer. Yeah, I think that's understandable too. Look, I, I come through the school system as an Aboriginal, as an Aboriginal man, and certainly as an Aboriginal boy learning history in this country in the 50s and 60s. We weren't in it. 
I mean, it was all about explorers, discoverers and settlers. There was even a spot for a cricket, a Don Bradman and a racehorse Farlap. But we weren't in it except as um, a dying race or we belonged to the Stone Age. You know, and, and my grandfather was a very prominent early Aboriginal activist. I mean, people like him were not in these stories. So you can understand some sort of resentment. And again, with the glorification of um, Cook discovered Australia. I mean, he didn't discover Australia. Aboriginal people have been here for 65,000 years. And it has been open to conjecture now for nearly 100 years that quite possibly the Portuguese were on the east coast of Australia, you know, 250 years before Cook touched down on the east coast of Australia. And except for the great fire in Lisbon in the, was it the 16th century, those maps may not have, may well be still here today. And we do know that the British Admiralty did have some of those early, not the very serious ones of those, some of those missing voyages, but had some maps of the um, earlier time periods that may have um, you know, shed some light of where they went. Great. Thank you, John. Um, I think now we might uh, throw it open to, to Peter and John. And, um, Can we talk to each other as well? <laughs> that's hopefully, hopefully the point. Professor, I'm interested, you know, the theory, there was a theory that uh, Cook knew about Sydney Harbour, but kept it secret. I don't believe that theory. I'm interested if you, if you do. I, I, look, um, I still think there's a, there's a possibility about the Portuguese. I mean, you think that they were up in um, Timor, you know, um, um, for such a long period of time, 200 years, you know, and they're only 200 kilometres from you know, the top end of Australia. And the Portuguese were in such incredible explorers and ships uh, right across the globe that they didn't go further in regards to that. I think that's, you know, mm. um, whether Cook had um, any um, Portuguese material, well, I don't know what the proof is. No, I'm talking about the, the, the theory was, because what happened is, of course, that Cook gets to Botany Bay mm. yep. and maps Botany Bay. He, when they, they're only there for six days, they leave, I think, on the morning of the 6th of May, maybe the 5th of May, and yeah. they see the em entrance to Port Jackson on yeah. the left, as I put in the book, you know, talk about part, past the port to the left. They mm. passed the port. They never went in. Yeah. And then in, Philip comes in 1788. They go to Botany Bay. They hate it. Six yeah. days later, he, I think it's six days later, he goes up in the strong boat. They come into long boat. They come into Port Jackson and he writes the immortal words later. He says, I have discovered, discovered the finest natural harbour in the world where a thousand ship of the realm can sail yeah. in full security. But there yeah. was a theory that came up in the research that mm. Cook, Cook knew all about Sydney Harbour, but th that to keep it from the Portuguese, to keep it from the Dutch, to keep mm. it from the French, didn't, didn't, uh, didn't no, don't that, put it in, on, in the public domain. But I don't believe that because yeah. the reason I don't believe it is if... If you, it, it would have got out from the 95 men of the endeavour that there's the most extraordinary natural harbour in the world just north of Botany Bay. And the other one was Philip would have known about it if Philip, Philip would have gone straight to Sydney mm. Harbour rather than gone to Botany Bay. Yeah, Cook's, Cook's remembered as well as missing some of the best harbours in the world, <laughs> Auckland and Sydney and Newcastle. <laughs> <laughs> so, but I think the, the thing with Botany Bay is interesting as well because going in there, I mean, it's, it's all swampy. I mean, it's full of mosquitoes. I mean, so, I mean, the spot they went and the Aboriginal population yep. was as large there. As you said, if they've gone around the corner and gone into uh, Sydney Harbour, I mean there would have been a different viewpoint to have taken on board in that mm. location. And as we know from Philip's observations, um, he certainly recorded that the Aboriginal population was much larger than they originally thought yes. when they got there. And there's at least three or four points in Philip's diaries where he says the population within a 10 square uh, kilometre region of Sydney Cave was thousands of Aboriginal people. Yes, and in, so, in the course of doing my book, we worked out, we thought that, that Captain Cook in the time, four or five months that he was in Australia, they never saw more than 200 of the First Nations people in mm. that whole time that they were there. They were flitting, mostly they were flitting figures in the distance, um, yeah. apart from when they hit the, hit, hit the barrier reef and then they came, mm. came ashore at what we know as Queensland. But in terms of the sailors after their experience in Tahiti and mm. to a lesser extent in New Zealand, they're looking for 
maybe, you know, Australia will provide beautiful women coming for them. And mm. in their whole time in Australia, they saw between them, they saw one rather uh, aged elderly, an, a, a female elder, and they saw one naked woman on the beach in Queensland, and that was it. But mm. mostly the Indigenous people were at a distance to them. And it's also the location, Pete. I mean, Botany Bay, as I said, was a location where you're not going to have a large population. No. There was so much swamp there. <laughs> I was fascinated in terms of, again, the politics that we're in at the moment of invasion, about whether it's inv Australia Day's mm. Invasion Day, etc. There's an extraordinary quote from Captain Cook. I think it was 1774 um, on his second voyage, and he was looking at what happened. They'd, they'd had a fight in the New Hebrides, and he said these natives they could be forgiven for thinking we've come to take their land. You know, mm. that they said, you know, if they, they block us with force, we overwhelm them. We mm. take what we need. And the, the final line was they, be, they could be forgiven for thinking we want to invade them. Mm. It will be up full stop. It will be up to us to persuade them differently. But mm. Cook, for me, again, was not, he was obviously of, the, of British imperialism, but he was an instrument of empire rather than imperialist himself. He didn't, he didn't just say, shoot them all, you know, have sex with them all. He was calm and controlled, mostly, apart from what happened in New Zealand, which was awful. But he, he was not. There were British captains that just used the natives, you know, shoot them all down, no problem. I mean, open up the, open up the cannon on them. But Cook was never yeah. like that. Can you tell but us, Peter? That, that, um, that, sorry, but John. I'll I'll just just... Say that that's a, but that's a great point of yours, Peter, that you've put down. He was the man who, first instance, fired over those two warriors' heads. Yes. Then he fired small shot to wound them. And when that warrior went back up and got his shield and come back down to the beach and they threw stones and then they sent a volley of spears in, he shot that man. So, and you're quite right, he's the man who pulled the trigger. Yep. So, you know, I mean, that, in, it, that says something as well. I mean... And, and on, that, on that subject, that shield, that gad eagle shield mm. is in the British Museum. Mm. It's in Cabinet 95. If there That's is a right, holy too. relic of Australia... <laughs> That yeah, should right. be in yeah. Australia. Should be in the Maritime Museum or the National. That's our shield. That's our yeah. shield. And I went. I went over there in January with an Indigenous man, Rod yeah. Baker, and you know, basically, give us back our shield. Well, no, no answer sure, came the stern sure reply broadly. But but the uh, you carry on. And no, I'm interested. I guess just to to from the conversation now, um, just to talk a little about. Uh, the claiming, the planting of the flag on Possession Island and the claiming of the nation okay. for the king. I love that story. And uh, the, the um, you know, I guess, terra nullius as a, as a flow on from okay. it. Okay. But, but yes, and it was a flow on from it. But, but uh, it was, I think it was in August, from memory, again, I'm not sure, 22nd of August, yes. but they get to the tip of Cape York and they're about to, they're about to head west to go between what we know as New Guinea and the northern, northern part of Australia. Cook has the sealed instructions, so he knows the sealed instructions are basically, with the consent of the natives, mm. claim any territory that you may think be useful. Well, that was the key phrase, with the consent of the natives. They stop at an island, they drop anchor at an island, which he's since afterwards named as Possession Island. They climb the hill, he's looking for the way to the west, the passage to the west, and then they, they, they basically plant the Union Jack, and very broadly, they say, dib, 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 dob, 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 we claim, all of the east coast of Australia, and they fired the shots in the air, and I think the ship fired the cannon back in salute. And it was on the basis of that, that and they did this in various parts of the Pacific Ocean. It wasn't a specific thing to Australia. And it was only afterwards that when Australia said, we want, you know, they, England said, we want to send our convicts there. Well, we've, we've claimed possession of that. And A, there were natives in the distance, but of course there was no natives to give their consent. From our point of view, it was an absolute absurdity to plant the flag and say, we claim this in the 65,000 years of Indigenous occupation. And so absolutely absurd, but fascinating. But another common myth is the terra nullius myth, that Cook claimed terra nullius. In all of Cook's works, there's no mention of terra nullius. And, you know, in his sealed instructions, it was with the consent of the natives. They could see the natives. They weren't claiming it was the land was empty. And it was only, I think, 1835 that Governor Burke was the first one to introduce the concept of terra nullius. So in terms of the sins of the white people in Australia, 
where do we begin? We're only here for an hour. So, and the effect on the indigenous population, absolutely enormous. But to visit that upon Captain Cook is simply not fair. Mm. John, any, any... Yeah, no, well, Peter's right. I mean, th those orders were explicit. I mean, they're from the Adm Admiralty and as such from the Crown, because remember that King George III actually was the one who put up the £4,000 to buy the, the endeavour and have it fitted out to start with. And those orders were quite explicit. Um, to yes, I mean, contact, uh, open dialogue and discuss, gain the consent of natives to open up a couple of trading posts. I mean, they had opportunities. On the only opportunities they had were in uh, Gamay or you know, Botany Bay or up in um, Queensland with the Endeavour River to open dialogue and discussion, but they didn't either. I um, mean, if he was going to do that, he needed to find somewhere to actually sit down with people and open up some sort of dialogue, discussion and gain consent. We know he didn't do it. He sails onto possession of, plants down that flag and claims the entire East Coast. As such, he's in violation of orders from the Crown as such, because that's where that come from. I mean, that's from the Admiralty and it's from the Crown. So he's claimed the entire East Coast of Australia for the Crown, which is in violation of what his orders were, because he did... I haven't, I haven't followed that part, Professor. Why was he in violation of the orders from the Crown? Because he, you know, the, the order were open dialogue, discussion. Oh, I see, yes. yes. With the consent of the natives. Mm. Yeah. The fascinating <laughs> thing for me too, the most moving part of the Cook story for me, well, an echo of the Cook story is I mentioned the warriors saying warra, 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 why. The mm. most haunting thing is that Philip comes, as we mentioned in 1788, they go to Botany Bay, they come up to Sydney, Sydney Cove, Basically, for those who don't know, basically where the Museum of Contemporary Art is, right there at Circular Quay, that's where they cut down the first trees and they start the occupation and the settlement and the convicts and the rest of it. So six months later, in late July, one of the English sailors writing home about what it's like here refers to the First Nations people and refers to them as we call them the Warras. Why do they call them the Warras? Because everywhere the white fellas go, the First Nations people are shouting at them, warra, 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 why? They shouted so often, get the hell out of here, that that's the name that they became known as. Mm. And I think that's an interesting point too to touch on is because that's what Cook said. All they seemed to want from us yes. was to be gone. Mm. I mean, he wrote that in his journal. You can't be any more explicit. He's saying it himself. There's no, there's no welcome mat role there. Um, quite clearly, Aboriginal people are saying, get the buggery out. We don't want you here. <laughs> mm. Can I ask, um, uh, now, uh, you know, obviously 2020, it's 250 years mm. since the voyage. Um, why do we think it's important as a nation to, to look back and to, and to mark this event today? For me, it's not a thing of celebration. It's a thing of commemoration. It's a thing of understanding who we are, where we came from, what we're about. And so this, I mean, because of the coronavirus, which will, mm. you know, the, all of the, well, all, I was about to say the word celebrations, all of the commemorations, as far as I know, they're just about all cancelled. I'll be fascinated to know what happens mm. on the day because nothing's as important right now as keeping everybody healthy mm. and healthy, as healthy as we possibly can. But... For me, understanding our history, for me, when I first read a book, I didn't particularly focus on Indigenous history, particularly, until I read a book of the Mile Creek Massacre by Peter Stewart. And I read that book and I finished it at four o'clock in the morning and I was in tears because it was the first time I had an understanding of, wow, this, this is a part of our history too. This is these appalling acts that were done. and mm. It's only through, you know, talk about reconciliation, constitutional recognition, the Uluru Statement. It is only by us understanding what happened that we can start to heal the wound. Mm. And so Cook is a large part of that. I, I, I'm fascinated by the Dutch part. I did a book on the mm. shipwreck of the Batavia. That's fascinating. But the Dutch didn't then go on to settle in Australia. The English did. So that first moment and understanding what Cook saw. And... Uh, the, the story that I love most out of it was when they go, when they land after they hit the reef. And it was, they hit the reef 
11th of June, 1770. So they're about eight knots in the middle of the night, 11 o'clock at night, they hit the reef. It puts a hole in the front of the endeavour, piece of coral breaks off, and it is only by fencing wire and elbow grease and great luck and great leadership by Cook and Cook himself working the pumps and Joseph Banks for the first time in his life rolling up his sleeves and working. The, really, they get, to the, they get to the coast there. They get to the Queensland coast, what we know as Queensland, and they're there from the middle of June to the beginning of August. And there's many skirmishes with the First Nations people there uh, while they're there until at one point uh, an Indigenous elder comes forward with 12 warriors behind him and proffers to Cook a broken spear. And it's the, it's the symbol of, basically, it was the way they understood it was, here's the broken spear, we must live together in peace. And uh, for me, that is the great, that's the great story out of the Cook experience there and how wonderful it would be if I'm just, I, I've just, I've dedicated my book to, uh, oh goodness, there, you, there it is. Um, I, I, uh, I, I'm going to read you my dedication, but it, that, that should be the symbol, the motif of, of mm. Australia. The I broken wonder, spear, people wanting to live together in peace. I wonder, um, John, what, what are your thoughts are in terms of yeah, you know, yeah, 2020 yeah. marking... Yeah, yeah. Look, um, for me, and as I said before, I mean, as growing up and going to school in the fifties and sixties, I mean, it was just a white history. I mean, we want a more balanced understanding today, and we have come a long way in regards to that. But I'm not just proposing yet. We just want a black history. We've seen what it's like just to have, you know, a one-side view. So we need to get this balanced understanding. And I mean, and, and, and the Cook story involves Aboriginal people there at Gamay. Up on, the, up on the Endeavour River. I mean, I gave a keynote address at the National Library for their Cook exhibition uh, just over 12 months ago. And the amazing thing about that is they had people from Tahiti. They had people from Hawaii. They had Maoris there. They had people from the locations in Sydney and up on, in Queensland on the Endeavour River. So there was a space for Indigenous people to put our viewpoints across in, and other peoples in the Pacific as well where Cook went put our perspective across. So I think that's the way we need to go forward. And again, for me, this country's greatest treasure is embracing 65,000 years of Indigenous cultural history and memory, the longest memory carried by humankind. And that's what this country actually, that's its richest treasure. And that is a part of the history of this continent. And mm. that's there for, for all to embrace. So, you know, and the Cook story is a part of that 65,000 year history as well. Yeah, and certainly, again, as I've spoken to people in this role, um, the conversation around truth telling of our history mm -hmm. is incredibly important for you know, Indigenous and non Indigenous Australians to ensure that we actually can speak the truth and as a nation learn and grow from that. Well, I think that's an important thing with the, um, uh, the earlier statement. And I mean, the way we are to go forward, and it was interesting. Um, um, that both um, Scott Morrison and um, 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 God, I've had a memory lapse, the leader of the opposition, um, Anthony uh, Albanese. Anthony Albanese, you know, um, in their statements in regards to closing the gap, both commented very prominently on the point of truth telling. And I think in the next few years, truth telling is going to be a major focus for this country and for us all to at some point join hands and move forward onto a better um, future for all of us, uh, is to get through that process. And, uh, and I think it, and as a process of healing for us all, that we can, uh, we can deal with the truth and uh, move forward. Thanks so much, John. Mm. But now, uh, and Peter, thanks so much for that Thank conversation. You. We've now got uh, a few minutes remaining to uh, take some questions from our online audience. Thank you so much for, um, for bringing them in. We've got one here from uh, Brian. Uh, which is a question for, for John. Uh, is there any oral tradition with local communities that might refer to other European arrivals aside from Cook? Um, um, let me see. Um, look, I, I couldn't say off the top of my head. No, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not really sure. And we're looking at it other than Cook. Um, 
certainly the, the Portuguese one angled, I mean, from before, there's nothing there that I'm aware of in oral tradition that's been handed down on the east coast of Australia. Um, so, um, no, I couldn't say. Right. Thank you. Uh, and then we have one from uh, William Hutchinson. Uh, and I'll hmm. throw this one to Peter. Are there any clues as to why Cook on first sighting Australia did not land and instead turned hmm. north up the coast? I mentioned uh, the book I'd done on the shipwreck of the Batavia when I went to Holland and I went to the archives in The Hague and they brought out for me a map, I think it was from 1634, and there was the map of Australia, bar the east coast. So mm. they, they were all over Australia, bar the east coast. Van Diemen, I think it was at 1642, had been to Tassie, had, had mapped Tassie. So for Cook, you know, he was on his way home. And what, one of the reasons they go, they go to the north, that's the best route, because they're hoping to go across the top. Um, but that was the part that he was, a, he was a man that loved nothing more than to chart coastlines that had not previously been charted. So that, that, was, that was the go. And the reason they didn't stop as they headed north, they were looking for a bay, a, 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 a great place to, to stop. And the first great place they came to was Botany Bay. Yeah. Yeah, we have a, a, not a great coastline for uh, <coughs> safe, safe berthing. No. In. Um, but we do have the best harbour in the world. That's right. <laughs> well, you wouldn't know that. Uh, we're speaking on a night where I think we've told all of our cruise liners. Mm. One of them was escorted out tonight with a police helicopter over the top. So it's, it's funny that we should be talking about this 250 years later. Uh, thank you so much, Peter. Um, this, I'll throw this open, I guess, to, to mm -hmm. either of you from Alison Brooks. Uh, what did the Indigenous people do after Cook fired his shots at at Gamay, Botany Bay. The, like most in, the most interesting thing for me is that he dropped the shield. The elder man dropped the shield. And when you go to the British Museum uh, and you see Cabinet 95, there it is. And you can see the, there's a hole in it. And I'll, I don't know if it's been forensically examined, Professor, but I'd love it to be forensically examined to know, is that, is that hole made by a flying piece of small, small piece of lead? But mm. they drop the shield, they disappear back, but then over the next six days, they do have small interactions with the, with the local community. Mm. Yeah. There's differences in Cook's and Salander's and Banks' accounts of that event, you know, and how seriously wounded was the ab older Aboriginal man? I mean, yep. he may well have been seriously um, wounded. We're not to know that because those accounts certainly differ in their opinion on that as well. So, um, you know, but certainly the... Um, that third shot was certainly enough to um, the one over the head, the small shot, but then the third shot certainly um, mm. um, took them away. Mm. It was extraordinary courage of them to be Absolutely. confronted, to be confronted by something that size, to mm. have a man pull out a, what must have looked like a stick for it to emit thunder and lightning mm. and stand their ground. Mm. Wow. Mm. Yeah, amazing. Yeah, that's right. I think we've got now a question from Judith. Who do we think would be a modern equivalent of Cook? I, I, somebody said on Twitter last night that uh, the best modern equivalent of Cook was Neil Armstrong. And I didn't have time because I think Twitter's only 280 mm. sp spots <laughs> to, to reply. But in essence, Armstrong was an extraordinary man. And I, 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 I love the Armstrong story. But Armstrong himself said, you know, I, st I was standing on the shoulders of 5,000 other engineers and technicians all over the world. You know, I was the guy in the tin can that was propelled up there. Where, and we, if it hadn't been Armstrong, it would have been somebody else. In terms of Cook, Cook's achievement to, to do what he did, I mean, in the end, this country was going, Europeans were going to get there by, by somebody. Mm. But Cook, if Cook had not been so extraordinary a maritime man... That 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 the endeavour the endeavour of the endeavour would have failed, and to to lead the men over that length of time to do it over three voyages, but particularly I think that night of getting off the reef, the the leadership he showed that night in getting the stuck endeavour off the reef was amazing. Mm. Any thoughts, yeah, John? I yeah, I I guess you know space exploration is the probably the the, the place you could come to yeah. um, in in looking at that, but quite rightly, as Peter said, there's a lot of assistance in that, in that process. Um, um, so Cook was more or less on his own. Um, but even with running aground on the um, 
the reef, there was at least three occasions uh, when he went far too close to the shore, and that was, again, it was a full moon when he ran aground, that he didn't learn his mistake. Mm. <laughs> so uh, not taking into account the full moon and then thinking he was safe, but he wasn't. <laughs> Thanks, John. I think we've got now a question from Stephen from Paddington, which is, um, again, as we've mm. uh, undertaken our, our research with Encounters 2020, the role of banks in terms of uh, his return to, to uh, England and the ultimate uh, settlement. Mm. Um, so Cook is, the question is, uh, Cook is blamed for much, but banks seems very little. Well, Shouldn't banks' role in Australian history be studied more? I think I find banks a fascinating character. Absolutely fascinating. And it's forgotten. But when Cook got back, the British headlines, the English headlines were basically Mr. Banks has returned. The, the Banks expedition, he was the one that got, uh, gathered all the fame. And Cook, in the English public mind in the early time, was little more than a glorified taxi driver. And there were some struggles between Cook and Banks as to who does what, when and who, who leads. And in the end, it was Cook who affirmed his own command. What, one thing that fascinated me about Banks was Banks was a, I mean, he, he was so industrious. I, I mentioned earlier pulling his sleeves up, where, which may have implied laziness, but he was not lazy when it came to science, when it came to mm. botany. You can believe when they got to Botany Bay, they were stunned, you know, and they were seeing kangaroos and wallabies and wombats and kookaburras. I mean, they'd never seen anything like it and all the plant life like they'd never seen. And they, they, they gathered so much stuff and put it into their boxes to this day, there are, there are envelopes and boxes in the British Museum that have not been opened, that were gathered. That was Banks. But something that fascinated me about Banks was that in the early 1800s, he was one of the leading voices in England against abolishing slavery. You know, <laughs> amazing mm. for me that, that, you know, William Wilberforce was making making all the noise, let's abolish slavery, and Banks was the one again. And Banks, it was never quite clear he had two... African servants. Now, it was not clear whether they were, I, I could never, I put a researcher on it in England to say, you know, I'd love to see a bill of sale, slave trading, did, were they bought slaves? And you could, I could never find the documentation, mm. but I speculation that he actually had two slaves himself, which shows, you know, he was an aristocrat. Um, he went, it went back, and I mean, in Tahiti, I mentioned how abstinent Captain Cook was. Well, the gold medalist for Sexual Congress in Tahiti was Joseph Banks. Yeah. He started out with one partner, then two partners, then two women and a man, and he wrote them all down. I mean, it was just wow, amazing. There was the Playboy side to him, that's for sure. That's right. But I, I think, um, I think uh, my, my my comment on that is regards to yes, Banks should be recognised in the influence he had uh, in 1788. He was very, very influential. Yes. Cooks wasn't influential, but Banks was. Yeah. Banks, Banks was influential in, I think it was back in the 1780s when the subject came up. So the Americans had won the War of Independence mm. and the Brits had been sending, I think it was a thousand convicts a year across the Atlantic. Where are we going to put our convicts now? And there was, Banks was one of the two, one of the two key figures um, mm. to say, try Botany Bay. We've been there, that's where you could, that's where you could try a settlement. And Banks right. was a very, very influential voice. Mm. Mm. It's good to clarify because certainly, again, on the research as part of uh, at the Maritime Museum and our other national institutions, uh, there's a significant number, I think over 40% of Australians believe two things. One, that Cook discovered Australia. Yep. <laughs> and two, that he came on the first fleet. Mm. And, and, not even, and not even Cook said he discovered Australia. Mm. Cook, in his notations in late July 1770, said the honour of discovering this place belongs to the Dutch, not to me. I mean, when Cook himself didn't say he discovered it, I think we can put that one to bed. Mm. And one last question. Uh, let's start, John, with you, if that's right, from uh, Mesh Thompson. What are your thoughts about celebrating, about celebrating Cook and his arrival uh, now? What are your personal thoughts, I guess, as an Aboriginal man? Well, look, there's, you know, there's, there's a lot of... Um, <clears throat> opportunity for Aboriginal people to be involved. I mean, um, you know, I was involved with this discussion. I was being asked to speak at an event up in Queensland. And I mean, there's lots of events. I mean, I look back to um, 1970. I mean, it was just a time period of reenactments again and that sort of stuff. We weren't basically in the picture again. 
So we are in the discussion and we are putting our, our voice into this um, space, if you like, which is a big difference. And I think um, having those different viewpoints and, um, you know, and understandings, and it meant quite clearly, I mean, stating that, and Peter's just commented on that, James Cook didn't discover Australia. I mean, from our perspective, we've always been here. And scientifically, we've been here for over 65,000 years. And, of course, the Dutch have been here prior to that. Um, the Spanish have been up the top. The, the Portuguese have been here. You know, um, so, you know, there's, there's been a lot of events. Uh, Dampier was even here. So, <laughs> the English were on the West Coast as well. Mm. So um, he didn't discover Australia. So um, I think that's the important thing. I totally disagree with the circumnavigation celebration and thankfully, that's been postponed by COVID-19, you know, and I just saw that as an incredible waste of money and, and in reality, just adding to a myth that doesn't exist because the endeavour did not sail around Australia. Hmm. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone, for your questions. That's an uh, unfortunate time we have for, for tonight's program. Uh, we've been incredibly fortunate to have two people with us tonight with such knowledge, wisdom and vision. Uh, to Can speak I ask you a question, Bill? Certainly. Peter. What did, I, it was Professor John Maloney who I wanted to credit with that idea of using the broken spear as a symbol for the nation. What do you think of that as an idea? Oh, I think it's an extraordinarily powerful image. Uh, hmm. you know, if, as, a, as a symbol for the nation. Well, it's a nation uh, you know, now that is uh, very diversified in, with people from all over the world now living here, but to have a, a single strong representation that speaks to our uh, 65,000 years of Indigenous strength and cultural mm. strength um, and to speak to reconciliation and offering of, of peace, as you spoke about, is an incredibly powerful image. Thank you for having us at your place. We've had a lovely time. Thank you, Professor. Thanks, Thanks, Peter, thanks John. On behalf of the... The Maritime Museum, our online audience, thank you both. Uh, I'm not sure how we do virtual applause, but there's some, some happening. So thank Lovely. you very much. Uh, so please uh, join us at our next live webinar, Ocean Talk, Recovering Refugee Narratives, which will be on Thursday, the 4th of June at 6.30 p.m. Thank you very much and good night.